this video, we're going to take a look at some prototyping tools that I made inside of Maya to make your life a little bit easier to get a jump start and get moving a little bit quicker whenever you want to prototype out some ideas and just use some very basic shapes. So you can see here on the Gumroad page, I've put together this download page. And if you're a UCF student, I've added a discount code so you can go ahead and get these tools for free. Let's go ahead and take a look inside of Maya. After you download this, you're going to get a uh, zip file. And if you can go ahead and find where that zip file is and then put it in a location where you want to unpack it, you can just go ahead and open that up. I'll just double click on this real quick and show you what's within the zip file. So under prototyping tools, we've got some basic shapes and within there is a basic shape collection like what you saw on the image. And there's also some cubes, cylinders, floors, and wheel shapes. So it's just starting off right now. We've got this default scene, which I'll explain in just a bit. And I've got FBX presets. I'll be explaining those as well. An HDRI file that I took from the Unreal Engine from their free content that exists within the engine content. And then also lighting. I've got uh, two different little lighting setups that you can drag within the scene pretty easily to have lighting on your objects in real time in the viewport 2.0 and I've got two different materials that are in here I've got a default blend and a blend reflective that uses the HDRI file as the thing to reflect from we also have scale tools and I've put the UE4 mannequin within there and then added a little mel script that will add a controller to the base of the model and allow you to just move the model around a little bit easier so after you unpack this, you can put it anywhere where you want on your folder location. I have mine in a particular place, and if you unpack it, what you should have here is these prototyping tools. Mine might look a little bit different because I've got some additional tools that I'm using for 3D printing and things like that. So if you see any difference in folder structure, just know that that's what's going on. It's just some very specific tools that I've developed for myself. So I'm going to go ahead and take a look at Maya, and if you remember what I was telling you about the default scene that exists within here, this is what I'm going to have you load up as the base scene. Um, with this base scene, what I have turned on is anti-aliasing, so it's got nice uh, rendering of the wireframes. We also, ha also have uh, screen space ambient occlusion turned on. We're rendering in viewport 2.0 in the viewport. And if we take a look at this on here, I've upped the light limit to 16. So we can do 16 real-time lights uh, within here. Spe screen space ambient occlusion, I don't think I've really changed anything on here, but if you want to up the quality, you can do that. It might uh, make the scene run a little bit slower. So you kind of need to find this good balance between performance and then also how good does it look. We also have anti-aliasing and I turned on smooth wireframe, multi-sampling, anti-aliasing. If you want to up the quality of that, it's possible that you can do that as well. I left it on 8 here. And we also have a floating point render target. And then this is enabled and this is set to 32 by 32 by 32. And so that should give us nice uh, looking gradients within here. The other thing that I turned on in this scene is under lighting and we have two-sided lighting turned on for this so then that way you get lighting on both sides of your objects and one side of your object won't be pure black. I also have turned on shadow and I have shadow information turned on. So I've got a custom shelf here that I just made and then I'm going to show you the content browser. The way that this thing works is very similar to what Unreal has for their content browser and I'm trying to emulate that workflow the best that I can using the tools that Maya has. So if you go under Windows and you go to General Editors and Content Browser, you can load it up this way. So that's one way that you can get to it. If you go to Windows, General Editors, Content Browser, and if you hold down Control and Shift and click on that word, it'll actually throw this in to the shelf for you and then you could get a button a mel script button that you can just click and it'll open up the content browser so if you continue to use these tools to set up things it might make things just a little bit faster for you to go ahead and set it up that way so the first thing i kind of want to talk to you about is setting your project so maya's got a setup to where it's going to recognize where particular folders sit certain textures and things like that for a project the first step of that is setting your project and if i go to um, project here and i say set project we can go and we can go navigate to where that actually sits so if I go to my location and I go to where I put the tools and I go just find it here and I hit set, that's going to set the um, 
the project for us, so it's really easy to get back to that location. Now the other thing that I found within this tool that makes it really simple to come back to this and get back into this area that we are looking at for the tools, we can go back one directory, just click right here, and then we'll find the folder that we unpacked and we got uh, the prototyping tools right here like this, and if you right click on it, you can say add to favorites. Once that's done, if you click this button right here, you can go to favorites and you can see we can always come leave this tab open and go to prototyping tools and then get here to this base area with all the different uh, folders that you see within here. So the first thing I'm going to have you take a look at as far as what this content has is under scale tools, if we go to the UE4 mannequin, we can just click and drag out into the scene. Before we do that though, um, there's one thing that I want to point out. I'm using FBXs so I can move information back and forth between Maya and UE4 very easily. Now there are some settings that we have to set within uh, our FBX settings to get things to work correctly because normally if you drag this in and we drag another copy it won't make two versions of the mannequin and it'll take a look at the mannequin that's in the scene and know that it's got the same name and it's going to have problems trying to update that. So I did have to change some of the presets for the FBX. Um, I did put within here, there's a folder called FBX Presets, so if you want to load that up and put that into the Presets area and load that with your FBX area, you can have that available to you. But I can show you the setting for that. It's pretty simple. You just go to File, Import, go to the Option box for that, and we need to go to Edit the Presets for this. I did have also on the FBX Import options, Remove Duplicate Shading Networks, so if it sees shaders that are named the same, then it should remove those and keep uh, the shaders all down to maybe one shader instead of having a bunch every time you import it in. I'll click Edit uh, Presets, and if I go to the Include area, if this is set to Add and Update Animation, you want to put this just to Add, like this. Now you are going to have to actually uh, save this preset, and you can put that in there the next time that you import, but I would probably uh, put this on, close it, actually import something in for the first time, um, so you could you could go to any of the any of the shapes that I've got within here and just load that up and import it in and that will make the changes that we did to the FBX presets stick so you only have to really do that once and then once that's done then we can go through and start adding multiple copies to things so I'm gonna hop back on over to the scale tools go to the UE4 mannequin just click and drag it in and um, I haven't done anything special with this model. Again, I've just added this NURBS sphere. And so if we go to create NURBS primitive and then go to circle, uh, we can pull that in and that can become a controller. And then just did an operation selecting this, holding down shift, selecting this one here. And if we go to rigging and do constraint, parent constraint, option box, we can hit apply for that. So I made a little MEL script that will go through and select these things for you and do that. So if we run it, it should at that point put this on here. If I put it on the move tool, tapping W, I can click and drag around. Now the reason that the character is in full silhouette right now is because I have lighting turned on. Hotkeys for that is if uh, we just want to look at shading, tap 5. If you want to see materials and textures, tap 6. If you want to see uh, full lighting, tap 7. So this is kind of a cool way to just check silhouette if you don't have any lighting in here. Let's look at what I've put together for the lighting information. So we can go to lighting, and then we can see I've got a light rig that you see here, and I can click and drag this out into the world, and this will load up the lighting rig that we have. And then I'll take this infinity wall that I've created and just click and drag that into here as well, and now we've got a nice setup. What you can see here though, and I haven't found a solution for this, why Maya doesn't hold some of the settings for the lighting. If I go into the lighting rig and open this up and go to the spotlight, I'll hit control A to bring up the attribute editor to take a look at the options for this. I'll go to the shadow information and what I would like to do, I'd like to up the quality by hitting it and putting it at 1024 somewhere around there and then taking this filter size and then dragging this up to five and you can see uh, the options that we have for there it kind of softens the shadow and makes the quality look a little bit better so if I put this back down to 512 like this you can see this is what we have here I've made a mel script that we can just drag into the scene and it should set those settings for you automatically but I am just kind of trying to describe to you some of the stuff that's going on that I might set up 
uh, when using these tools. The other thing is this infinity wall, a lot of times this becomes something that gets in the way and I really don't want to select it, I just want to see it and have it into the world. I've set up a layer over here so you can put this instead of template, put it in reference mode. So now we can see it, but we can't actually select it. And if you want to turn on and off the visibility of it, you can turn it off the visibility this way. Okay, so I'm going to keep coming through here and show you some more uh, things that I've actually added within here. If we go to basic shapes and we go to basic shape collection, I've made a series of primitives that I've made that are fairly decent geometry but they're all scaled the same so we've got some consistent results as we drag these things in so if I take the cone and I just push it over here if I hold down X I can snap to the grid and just move it along the grid settings that we have if you are curious about the grid settings that I've got I can go to display grid option box and you can see set your settings to these different settings and I like this for the color combination this sets up a, a nice grid pattern for pushing stuff from Maya to UE4 and working in the meters format. So I'll just go ahead and hit apply for that. So again, if you want to set up the grid and you ha want to have something similar to what I see, those are the settings for this. So what I've done with this geometry is if you tap one, this is going to show the geometry in a base cage. And if you tap three, it will show the model in a smooth mesh preview mode. So I'm just going to push this one off to the side. We can move these things around. We can uh, move along the different axes. I like to press my hand on Q, W, E, and R, my left hand, and then I can cycle between movement and then E for rotate and then R for scale. And then it should make it pretty easy for you to move things around. Now this is in a movement mode of uh, world, so it's going to be world aligned for the axis orientation for translation. If we want to move this in object mode, we can just double click on the move options, put this on object, and then this is probably going to be a little bit more forgiving for you for moving the things around because now we can rotate this, and if we want to move it along that axis that we rotated, uh, we're able to do so. Don't forget that you can always go to the channel box and you can type in specific numeric values and if you want to reset values it should be pretty simple for you to go back to the channel box and change things from a, a numeric standpoint. So I'm just going to take the cube, I'll drag the cube in and you can take a look and see the geometry that I made for that and I've raised it up 50 units just so it sits directly on the floor for this one. I'll just hold down X and then click and drag back for this. Mine's added the ability to hold down shift and you can drag out one of these axes and it'll actually clone it or duplicate it. So that's one way of doing it. And if you hold on X, again, we can snap this. If you want to duplicate it uh, using a hotkey, you can hit Control D and I'll hold down X and I'll just drag this up right here like this. And then so we've got a sphere. What I've done with the sphere was uh, there's a little trick where you can take a cube and you can hit three and it'll turn it into a sphere. And then if you go to modify, convert, smooth mesh preview to polygons, it's going to produce geometry like what you see here. So it's gonna take an, uh, a quadded version instead of a sphere with poles. And I kind of like that better. I do believe on this version, I took an actual sphere and then snapped all the verts to that sphere. Uh, because when you do the method that I just described before, the sphere isn't quite perfect as far as roundness goes but I was able to steal that information from a, from a real sphere. So I've already set that up, and if you tap 3 for that, you get the uh, smooth mesh preview version of that one. Uh, added a cylinder to the scene, and if I select this, you can see the geometry that we have here for this. Tap 3, you get nice rounded corners. I'll push this off to the side here. Also did uh, this kind of pill shape that you see here. Push this back here. We've got a pipe that we can use. We've got a pyramid shape, and we have a torus, like what you see here. So I think that's a pretty pretty good amount of uh, little things that you can play around as far as geometry goes. Uh, I do have a few more shapes in here. There's uh, cubes. If you go in cubes, there's some different size cubes and things like that. Nothing special or spectacular with that. Cylinders, same thing. There's only two different cylinders that we have within here. Floor shapes, I did make a few different floor shapes that uh, snap to each other, and I think they're set up in a, uh, in a meter format. 
like this. Let's see where our floor is actually sits. Uh, it, it looks like it's sitting down below, but it, it, it lets, lets the character rest on the ground plane like you see here. So we could make one meter tiles. I do have some beveling on some of the corners on some of these. And so some of the pieces are a little bit larger. This is a this is a two foot or I'm sorry, two meter uh, piece that you see here. Let me go ahead and hide the infinity wall. I also have some uh, corner pieces. I'm going to hide this one, hit control H, and you can see I've got a corner piece. But everything should be ready to snap on the grid and uh, use as pieces. So I've got a few different things here, different bends and different corner pieces that you can work together to, to build. Maybe if you want to think of it as like prefab kind of uh, sidewalks or something like that. Um, and I also just put one shape for a wheel, and it's a pretty pretty generic shape. So you can take any of these objects and you can tweak them uh, as you see fit. One thing that I didn't add to this that I that I think would be pretty nice, uh, if we go to uh, rigging or modeling, under there there's a deformation area. And what I do like to use is a... Um, a lattice deformer and if we go to the option box for this I'm going to set this to two by two by two divisions and then I could say group base and lattice together I'll hit apply for this and what this gives me is a box that I can just right click over this and say lattice point and I can grab these points um, sorry it's wanting to select the skeleton first so I gotta be a little bit careful I'm going to select this first point hold on shift and then click this and then I can take these shapes and I can easily kind of deform them and warp them based off of this box that we see here. Now it is possible uh, with the uh, wrap deformer, if I hit undo and go back to the original part here, if we change the divisions like this, you can change divisions in the X, Y, and Z dimension. You can get finer level control of how you uh, warp the object. But for the most part, I think it would be um, probably best to just do the 2x2x2. Two by two by two. And if we want to delete history, Alt-Shift-D, and that'll get rid of the, the lattice point. Um, and so again, this, this is gonna, that same workflow is going to work with any of the shapes that we have here. And I'll just right-click on here and say lattice point, and I'll grab these. Again, I'm grabbing the skeleton, right-click lattice point, sorry about that. I'll drag right over there and be a little bit more careful about this. So if your mannequin does get in the way, you can take any of your objects, just go ahead and select this, and then go make a, uh, a new layer. And you can give it a name. And what I like to do is just put like the same name and then underscore and then layer like this. And I'll hit save. And then that way I can just put it in a reference mode so I can see it. I can't actually select it. And if I want to turn on and off the visibility of this, let's go ahead and select this. And I just made a new layer. I did. If I would have clicked this one, it would have made a new layer and um, assigned it to this. So let me select that group and then just say right click and say assign selected objects. Now I can turn on and off the visibility and put this in reference mode and not select it like this. So that might come in handy for you and help you out. Moving on here, uh, if we go into HDRI, like I was saying, there is an HDRI file that I have within this area. And this is feeding into these materials that I made. So I made two very basic, simple materials. I made a default blend. I'll click and drag that in. And then I'll make a blend reflective. And I'll pull this in as well. So if I click any of the objects after I've pulled them in, I can right click on it and say assign existing material and I can find that blend default. The blend is going to be a little bit different than the Lambert and it's going to have a nice specular component to it. And if we do the blend reflective, I'll hold down shift and select multiple objects and then right click on here and say assign existing material. I'll do blend reflective. If you want to get to the hypershade and you want to actually see this stuff and see what's going on with everything, uh, let me maximize this real quick. It was off screen. 
And if you want to take a look at the blend and reflective, we can select this and we can uh, expand this and take a look at the different components. So for reflectivity, I just made a, an environment ball and then I put this HDRI file that sits within there. So if you do have any problems with the um, image actually loading up, you could select things through the hypershade this way and you could get to it or you could select the actual object hit control a and bring up the attribute editor and then go to the material tab that you see here and then under reflectivity uh, reflected color go to this area and go to the image and you should be able to find the image now if we set our project correctly and that file sits uh, within the same area which it should because I've built the directory structure for you it should be able to find that texture but if for any reason it can't find that texture and it's having problems that's where it sits so that should give you some pretty nice options to uh, prototype some things out and if you want to change the lighting setup if you want to do any of that kind of work uh, you're you're free to to do that you could go ahead and take the grid turn maybe the grid off we did have the infinity wall set up if you want to hide your lighting you can go to show and hide lights that will leave lighting on but it will turn off the display for things now if you just tap five again you can, this is just regular shading mode if you do six that's going to turn on that uh, any textures or materials definitions that we've made and if we tap seven we're going to go ahead and be able to get in to the area uh, with lighting and one last thing that i think i'll show you is if we select the spotlight within the outliner we can go to panels and we can say look through selected and then now we're actually going to look through that light that we see and then maybe i'll select one of these just tap f and then frame back out here so if you do want to change up the lighting uh, you can do it there uh, I could show you why there's some weird stuff going on with the uh, with uh, the polygons here. It has to do with the new near clip plane inside of Maya, but um, that'll go away as soon as you move the camera. And then we'll go back to perspective, panels, perspective, perspective. And you can see how we've uh, updated that lighting direction like that that way. So hopefully with these prototyping tools, it'll allow you to get into Maya pretty quickly. And I just found myself doing a lot of these tasks over and over again as far as what I was setting up for a scene. So I wanted to develop some things for myself. I really like the way that UE4 works as far as being able to use the content browser. And I noticed that Maya had something similar in there. So I've been just trying to uh, emulate that workflow to the best of my ability. And I thought I would share it out with all of you all.